All right, very good. So we'll talk a little bit about squamous cell carcinoma. And I do have to admit, this is a very difficult topic to throw into 12 minutes. You saw how great I did with cytology. Um, and this is a, a lot more involved, um, even just to know what to do. Um, just breaking it down, uh, we, we have diseases that look like squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, for example, eosinophilic keratitis in some of its forms, immune-mediated keratitis, can mimic squamous cell carcinoma um, in its appearance. Um, and it is essentially impossible to tell the difference for sure um, without taking a biopsy. Um, I'll get to that in a little bit as far as biopsies go, uh, but generally speaking, uh, the way that we've kind of a, are evolving with our treatment of immune-mediated keratitis, they're going to be treated similarly, um, except for we don't cut into the cornea any longer for immune-mediated keratitis. So um, we generally would utilize an anti-inflammatory treatment protocol prior to performing any surgery, and by surgery, I am also referring to biopsy. Um, if we biopsy the cornea, we really have to have a plan for surgery. Um, if you biopsy the cornea, take a sample, and know that it's squamous cell carcinoma, and then the owners decide not to come in for two more weeks, that might not be the same squamous cell carcinoma that you had when you biopsied it. Um, and I've had uh, enough of those over the years that have gone from being a quarter of the cornea to completely engulfing the cornea in a matter of 10 to 14 days, that, that makes me very nervous. And so if surgery is an option and, and the horses are going to come to us for surgery, I recommend that we get the biopsy at the time we do surgery. We are going to treat it with a keratectomy. We're going to treat it aggressively with adjunctive therapy. We're not going to do that differently if it's, if I'm just if I'm not sure if it's squamous cell carcinoma, but we are more sure that it's squamous cell carcinoma rather than immune-mediated keratitis, we are going to bi uh, biopsy or surgically excise that area as if it was a squamous cell carcinoma um, because it's much better to err on the side, uh, on that side, uh, on the side of, uh, of it being a tumor uh, and treating it and getting good margins around that tissue. Now, one thing that has changed a little bit that we haven't implemented yet is the ability for us to use ocular coherence tomography to screen those horses that we're not quite sure of what they have. Um, Immune-mediated keratitis, although it can be superficial, a lot of those horses, are, um, they're affected in their mid to deep stroma as well. Um, squamous cell carcinoma in, in general is not when it's on the surface of the cornea. So we, we can get a better understanding that way as well if we needed more um, convincing as to what was present. Um, but this is another uh, horse with uh, eosinophilic keratoconjunctivitis, which is considered to be one of the forms of immune-mediated keratitis. I threw this one in there, not because this looks horribly similar to immune-mediated keratitis, but often when we have conjunctival squamous cell carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma of the third eyelid that's been going on for a long time, or has been surgically excised and has recurred, it will often be associated with very copious amounts of mucopurulent odorous discharge. Um, and it can look like uh, an active eosinophilic conjunctivitis um, in their best form um, to a certain degree. But they, they do look different, but it certainly can confuse the issue a little bit. Superficial immune-mediated keratitis, as I mentioned before, has very uh, uh, kind of a large spectrum of presentation or manifestations that we will see, um, and some of them can be quite confusing. Generally speaking, if you treat a horse with immune-mediated disease or, or eosinophilic keratoconjunctivitis that's not ulcerated um, with corticosteroids, you will control the inflammation, not permanently, but you will be able to drive the inflammatory response down and um, that lesion that we can visualize will become smaller. 
tumors are not going to shrink. So um, that's a, a very useful tool um, when trying to kind of walk the, the line if, if we want to do surgery or not. Is it important to think about doing surgery? Um, or if you, um, certainly you could do a biopsy beforehand to know that, um, but just if you are going to biopsy the tissue, make sure you have a plan for surgery. It also is, gets, it's not that these tumors are different, but we have several different types of squamous cell carcinoma or several locations of squamous cell carcinoma that we have to deal with in ophthalmology um, or in equine ophthalmology particularly. Corneal conjunctival in combination. Um, make sure that you look far enough into the eye to see is it involving more structures than just what appears to be on the surface of the cornea. This is the same eye. Um, this extends back into the conjunctiva. The reason that I show this is that it's very easy to snip off that anterior section and think that you're getting most of it, and then the rest of it slips back into the fornix. And so if you do a biopsy, you send it off um, and think, okay, we have some time, it kind of gets lost in the shuffle, and three weeks later you go back and look at the horse, you have the results back, comes back as squame, uh, and then that can be very, very extensive by the time you come back. It doesn't have to be, but it can be. And so I always worry about um, those that, that kind of explode on us. If you see a, a, a mass that's highly pigmented, does not mean that that's a melanoma or melanocytoma. Generally, this tumor is going to develop in an area where there is conjunctiva present, and some of them will become quite highly pigmented. The surface structure of the tumor is very important. Uh, melanomas are generally going to be smooth and lobulated, um, even if they're not um, one homogeneous blob, but the surface of the squamous cell carcinoma is going to be very uneven um, and uh, have that cauliflower-like appearance to it. Conjunctival squamous cell carcinoma, in a lot of situations, will end up being corneal conjunctival squamous cell carcinoma. Um, I think it's just that we see them early. They don't get addressed a lot of times when they're this small. Um, this is a fairly small area. This very well could be an inflammatory response as well, or it could be just solar elastosis precursor to squamous cell carcinoma, but we won't know until we biopsy it. So generally when we see these, um, in this size and this location, it's great because it's a small area that requires treatment. We can excise and get very good margins of this, sometimes even taking the cornea. Um, and I would take cornea in this case because we have uh, a break in the limbus, not a, a break, that's, that's wrong terminology, but here you see how sharply demarcated the, the limbal pigmentation is. And then when you come down here along this edge, pigment's feathery as it goes into the cornea. Well, that pigment isn't just going to wander into the cornea because it's there. It wanders into the cornea because vessels are in the cornea. And so if you see pigment that's dusty like that or feathery, there is a vessel somewhere in that area. And there's probably several of them. Uh, third eyelid squamous cell carcinoma. For some reason, I couldn't find a really good one, and I don't know why. Um, because we see them quite frequently and they're a lot more, uh, they're a lot larger than this one is. Um, but that, it can often be a problem with third eyelid squam with recurrences, uh, that they're not set, um, excised deep enough down under the conjunctiva. Uh, and it's important to externalize the third eyelid when you remove it. Um, I generally recommend suturing the conjunctiva closed following surgery. This is really the only time I'll suture into um, uh, uh, tissue after removing the tumor, but we can get good enough margins away from the third eyelid. And it's not, certainly you can lop off the third eyelid, send it in for histo, you have good margins and just leave that to heal on second intention. 90% of the time that's going to be fine, but if you've missed a piece and you have um, recurrence of the mass, that mass can extend down now into the orbital space because you've opened the conjunctiva and provided a pathway to the space behind the eye. 
And so uh, it's really a precautionary measure to close the conjunctiva after resecting the third eyelid because you build a conjunctival barrier. Squamous cell is a superficial disease. If it starts to grow back, you'll see it and we can go get it and get it out of the conjunctiva again. Um, but there are a lot of people that don't think that that's necessary um, and so that you have to just be comfortable uh, when you do that. Eyelid squamous cell carcinoma is, I didn't mention this before, corneal conjunctival squamous cell carcinoma, is, that's not a disease that I worry about. If I have a horse that comes in with corneal conjunctival squamous cell carcinoma, I can fix it. Um, there are very, very few exceptions. Um, if we've had uh, an eye that's been um, surgically or a tumor's been surgically excised a couple times, it's recurred and it's gone deeper into the cornea, it becomes more problematic. Um, we have to do some creative tissue dissection in some of those cases, um, but w we still generally can get to them um, and the, the corneas can heal. They may require grafting pattern or have a longer healing process, um, but they do have a, a, a very good prognosis. <clears throat> And there's a lot of different adjunctive therapies that work well. Eyelid squamous cell carcinoma, on the other hand, is very different. Um, that can be quite aggressive. We're unable to get very good margins a lot of the times when we resect these tumors or excise them because we try not to compromise lid function. Um, and so in order to be very aggressive um, and to excise this tumor, you really would need to start your incision here and um, about midway along the upper eyelid margin, and then we need to get back into this area to remove here. Well, that's a pretty extensive eyelid uh, procedure, blepharoplasty, that needs to be done on that horse, which is also not the greatest approach um, for, for treating these. And so for, for eyelid squamous cell carcinoma, what traditionally will be done is surgical debulking and cryo. Um, that's great if you get most of the tumor out, but because cryo does extend into the tissue, we really don't have very good control of how deep it goes. It's temperature dependent, how quickly the probe starts to, um, or if you're using a spray um, uh, nitrous oxide, how long you can keep the temperature at the level you need it to be at. If you've done a freeze thaw cycle, if you've done enough of them, um, there's a lot of factors that go into that. And because we're, we can't see everything that needs to be removed, we probably see the number of recurrences that we do because they're not being treated aggressively enough. Um, and so we, we have some different um, treatments that we'll use to get at those a little bit better, and, and I'll talk about those um, now. So um, as I mentioned earlier, for um, squamous cell carcinoma of the cornea conjunctiva, surgical excision is, is our go-to treatment um, initially. Excise as much of the cornea around them as we can, and we will often go well beyond a millimeter or two millimeter margin, depending on the, the cornea. Um, looking at this eye here, and you'll see in a second how much we remove, that we'll leave a strip of cornea in the center that we don't have to remove all of the epithelium, but we take what we have to. Um, this is uh, that uh, eye that we saw uh, originally or early on that had the large, um, had a small area, and then when we opened the lids up, you could see it go further back. So we removed a, a large portion of the superficial cornea and all the conjunctiva that we could get around it, making sure that we go back two or three uh, millimeters behind that. And then we have to address the, the lesion in the front uh, as well. <clears throat> And so this is, this is a horse that underwent uh, photodynamic therapy with endocyanine green. Um, endocyanine green is a photosensitive dye that is activated by um, infrared light. And so we can, we can use um, a diffuse infrared light source to irradiate the surface of the keratectomy bed following injection of the dye or, or um, topical application of the dye. Um, to, to uh, treat those adjunctively. Um, it also helps with re-epithelialization um, and does have some antibiotic and antifungal properties. It's, uh, it's been un ma mainly in, in human um, dentistry and um, to treat fungal infections, or not 
dentistry, fungal infections, but to treat bacterial infections of the gingiva. Um, and it has also been used to treat um, uh, um, nail bed fungal disease as well. Uh, and so we, we use this adjunctively for, for several things, but mainly for squamous cell carcinoma to treat immune-mediated keratitis. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, is also using a CO2 laser. Um, topical uh, chemotherapeutic agents um, it can be utilized. Uh, essentially, a keratectomy followed by an adjunctive therapy procedure is generally very helpful. Um, for eyelid squamous cell carcinoma, we really need a, a, a pretty decent resection or deep bulking. And so we'll cut out the entire surface of that eyelid, that whole section that I, I outlined when we were looking at the other image, shell that area out, and then use um, the photodynamic therapy um, with a, a photosensitive agent that will, will activate that, that area. And then we essentially barbecue that tissue a little bit, char it um, after we irradiate it. Um, we do use higher levels of energy to treat eyelid squamous cell carcinoma than we do to activate the dye in the cornea. When we activate the dye in the cornea, there's no heat um, response. There's no charring of tissue. It just activates the dye. It does create some temperature increases, but it's not significant. So in order to differentiate between immune keratitis and, and squamous cell carcinoma, what we talked about uh, before, um, the clinical appearance can be deceptive. So we use an inflammatory trial to see if we can um, identify a reduction in size. Uh, but for surgical, um, or for definitive diagnosis, uh, we do need to have uh, biopsy and histological confirmation uh, of those cases. Um, of course, if it doesn't, isn't salvageable, sometimes the horses will need to lose their eye. I, I can't remember the last time that I had to remove an eye for a cornea or conjunctival squamous cell carcinoma, um, unless it came in and the orbit was affected. It had been one that had been treated a couple times and, and had recurred. Um, but if we get a first shot at them, um, they generally will do very well. Um, we have had to go back in and retreat um, certain areas, um, but, but a nucleation is becoming almost a, an afterthought now. Um, and it is important to keep in mind, and this is the reason, of course, are the cases that we deal with um, uh, influence us as well. So I, I had to euthanize a horse that had a third eyelid removed for squamous cell carcinoma that ended up metastasizing into his brain. Um, it had just been lopped off, and there was part of it in the caruncle that is does not a mobile tissue, and so when it grows, it grows down deep. And so um, that that probably has skewed me a little bit why as, as to why um, I like to suture those closed. But if you don't want to suture them closed, just make sure you get all the tumor out. That's the important thing there. Does anybody have any questions? All right. Yes. Janet? Did I? I thought I was going to talk about the endocyanine green. I don't remember a fluorescein. I think so, yeah. All right, well, thank you very much.